Hello and welcome everyone to the third conference of the second day of the Eastman Summit of International Relations. I am Rebecca Iotti and I am a member of the speaker's team of ICMA. From the very beginning, the Higma Summit of International Relations was thought as a way to break down the barriers between students and speakers and to get the chance to network and spark new interests and debates. So for this reason, you are deeply encouraged to participate, share your ideas and comments with us. In this way, we want to create a thriving community. The topic of the conference we're going to listen today is climate policies against structural inequalities. So the topic is going to be sustainability, which is one of our three pillars, along with digitalization and inequalities. These three pillars represent the three major challenges that we, the young, consider as important hurdles for our present and our future. Challenges that we need to be, to analyze, and we need to address. This conference in particular, I believe it is on the cutting point between sustainability and inequalities. We will analyze how the current climate situation from an economic and political standpoint, and then we will delve into the new given answers. So will sound climate policies help reduce structural inequalities? Professor Paulin is one of the best experts to answer this question. So thank you, Professor Paulin, so much for being here. We are thank honored you. to host you. Thank you. We are honored to host you in our summit, to which you will give relevant and insightful reflection. Professor Paulin, in fact, is a distinguished academic and a co-founder of the Political Economy Research Institute. Now, a bit of technical information. As you can see on this screen, there is a QR code to access, to access Slido. Slido is a platform from which uh, you can submit your questions or your comments <coughs> during the conference. Alternatively, if you cannot use the QR code, you can access by inserting the code, which is 265702. At the end of our guest presentation, we will gather all the questions and ask them to Professor Pollin. But before our kind moderator, Professor Elettra Agliardi, will sum up the main points and ask a core question. At that point, a pop-up will display to check your attendance at the conference for certificate purposes. Now, I will leave the floor to Professor Elettra Ayardi. Professor Ayardi is a full professor of economics at the University of Bologna. She did a PhD in economics from the European University Institute. Thank you all for joining us. It is an honor for us to provide you with deep analysis and opportunities of discussion. And we hope all of you will enjoy the conference. Professor Ayardi, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. Well, of course, uh, uh, well, congratulations on uh, uh, on this wonderful initiative, of course, uh, and uh, we are well, well thrilled to be here today with Professor Robert Pauling. And in, in particular, I'm very happy to uh, chair this important session on climate change against uh, structural inequalities. I have to say that as a member of the University of Bologna and a representative of Bologna today, uh, the University of Bologna is particularly sensitive to climate uh, change related <coughs> issues. In particular, we have developed in the last years about uh, a dozen of uh, degrees uh, in, uh, in different uh, disciplines uh, related to important aspects of climate change. In particular, I'm not talking only of uh, degrees in the science and engineering, but also in the uh, social sciences. For example, I belong to the Department of Economics and we have a, a master degree in resource economics and sustainable development, which is very successful. And last year, we also, as a university, started uh, a PhD, an interdisciplinary PhD on the future Earth, global change and societal challenges, which uh, is a PhD uh, in the interdisciplinary, as I said, because it collects about 14 departments in our university. And also we started a uh, research institute. Uh, it is called Alma Climate, which is a research institute on global challenges and climate change. And this is just uh, to say that uh, climate change uh, related issues uh, a very important topic in our university. And also in each course, uh, uh, we are committed to, to list uh, 
the most important sustainable development goals uh, related to our teaching. And of course, this also creates a lot of sensitivity from the point of view of students. And of course, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, uh, again, thanks for this uh, great uh, and amazing initiative, uh, which is a student driven. But today uh, we have uh, this great opportunity to have with us uh, a most influential economist, the most influential progressive economist it is also um, a thinker and a guiding leader. And also uh, we have the great honor to have here this figure of enlightening and inspiration uh, in uh, these kind of issues. In particular, just a, a few words, uh, even though uh, Professor Robert Pollin does not need uh, a presentation because it's very well known, but just a few words, just to say that uh, he is a distinguished professor of economics and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is also the founder and president of Pauline Energy Retrofits, which is a green energy company in the US. He has been writing uh, a lot of uh, research uh, uh, contributions in labor market, wages, poverty, in energy economics, in environmental economics, also in financial regulatory policies. And he also uh, has been a consultant and worked as a consultant for many organizations, nonprofit organizations. He has also worked for the US Department of Energy, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, the International Labor Organization on various aspects. Uh, and I would say various aspects also related to the issue of building high employment to green economy. And over the last years, he wrote many books, uh, especially on uh, green economy and green growth and global green growth. And in particular, uh, he has been a very influential uh, with his last book, which was published uh, last September on climate crisis and global Green New Deal, uh, which is uh, co-authored uh, with uh, Professor Noam Chomsky, who is uh, uh, well known as Professor of Linguistics, is actually the father of modern linguistics and, and also analytical philosophy and one of the world's uh, leading public intellectuals as well. And uh, in particular, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this book has been, is actually an extraordinary book. Uh, and uh, uh, let's say that it paves the way toward uh, uh, the path uh, of, uh, uh, I could say, the path of stabilization, climate stabilization. And it also uh, specifies in a very clear way uh, the green economy and the renewable energy and the sustainable growth, uh, which has to be uh, conceived in a way that uh, uh, it leaves no one behind and develops uh, new jobs at the same time. It has been uh, uh, also uh, defined as a survival manual for civilization. And this is just to say how influential this book uh, is. And of course, uh, uh, in, in which way, again, also with the, this important contribution, we can say that uh, Professor Pauline and knows very well what the responsibility of intellectuals is, and in this way, it is really a figure of enlightening and inspiration. And he has, just to uh, be concise on this, is also being selected by foreign policy as one of the 100 leading global uh, uh, thinkers uh, uh, in, in the field. So we're, of course, we uh, are very grateful for this. It is a great honor to be here. And of course, I will leave the floor to Professor Pauling, and I'm sure that uh, the discussion would be also very uh, stimulating and as usual, very rich uh, in insights uh, and uh, of course, uh, in uh, also future developments. So thanks again, and thanks uh, for being here. And the floor is yours, of course. Ah, uh, well. Uh, uh, I don't know. How to, uh, uh, is it? Are you getting feedback? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. What, what should I do? Now I can't hear you. No, no. Now it's perfect, Professor Pauline. It's just uh, it was a delay from Professor Ayadi. So please continue. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Agliardi. I mean, 
what an introduction. I don't know if I should even speak now because I, whatever I say is not going to be as good as what you built me up to say. Uh, but I'm going to do my best. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me, Rebecca. I'm very happy to be here. And I love the, uh, the spirit of this in that, yes, we should have a very uh, spirited, uh, vigorous discussions. Um, I'm going to speak, I guess the plan is for about a half an hour, but you know, if somebody really wants to interrupt me, uh, anyway, we'll have a lot of time to raise questions. And yes, we will also, after the session's over, have more time. So I will uh, go through this um, presentation and I wanna thank Rebecca for uh, dramatically upgrading the uh, visual aspects of my presentation. Uh, mine were pretty rudimentary as they always are, uh, but she decided to make me look a lot better at um, visuals than I actually am. Uh, but anyway, it's true, the content remains mine, so I will have to take all credit or blame for that. Um, okay, so um, this is the uh, topics that we're going to go through. We'll start out with the, the problem, what to do about it, uh, some proposals that are out there, the European Green Deal and Biden, um, and why uh, I want to focus on what I'm calling a Global Green New Deal. And I want to then address briefly uh, this approach that is, I think, even uh, more prevalent in Europe than in the US, uh, degrowth, and contrast it with the Green New Deal, and then finally come back to the point that uh, Professor Agliardi um, emphasized uh, that this is an approach to what I would call the Global Green New Deal. It is an, an approach that is able to coalesce a viable climate uh, stabilization path with egalitarianism, uh, with uh, raising living standards, fighting poverty, expanding uh, job opportunities, and, and, the, and the whole idea of overcoming the neoliberal era that has been dominant for the last 40 years throughout the world. Okay, so uh, first let's just lay out the problem. And I think that the best place to start is the 2018 report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, which is a, a branch of the United Nations. Uh, the IPCC is, uh, gathers research on climate change. They do not themselves conduct original research. They basically gather what is out there in the field and try to develop something, so, something like a a consensus view as to where the world is. So it's quite mainstream. This is not uh, uh, ultra uh, 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 left or right of any, any sort. It isn't especially alarmist in any sort. It is gathering what they regard as, as mainstream research. That said, uh, that when they came up with their 2018 report uh, called, um, uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius, that was itself alarming, especially because it was coming from this very mainstream organization. And what the point of this 2018 report was, was to say that uh, previous uh, research suggested that our climate stabilization goal should be that we should um, stabilize at a, a global average temperature of 2.0 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, uh, meaning above the average of around the period around 1800, pre-industrial time. Um, that was what they said was the target. In uh, the 2018 report, they said we had to stabilize at 1.5 degrees as opposed to two degrees. Uh, so that overturned the research on which this, uh, 2.0 degree goal uh, had been established and saying that if we don't hit a 1.5 degree target, what we are looking at is intensifying risks, heat extremes, more precipitation, droughts, sea level rises, biodiversity losses than what we had expected before. Um, and that therefore it really was time uh, to sound alarm bells. In fact, one of the authors of the IPCC report, not in the report itself, 
uh, Professor Raymond um, Pierre Humbert of Oxford University uh, says, uh, it's time to panic. That was his assessment. It's time to panic. So the IPCC report in 2018 was also useful in the sense that it said, okay, we, we can come up with a plan. And here's the plan, that we have to reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions by 50% as of 2030. And by the way, 2030 is only eight and a half years from now. We have to reduce emissions by 50% as of 2030. Actually, they said 45%, but roughly speaking, 50%. And we have to be at zero emissions by 2050. So that's what they lay out. Now, let me uh, map out where we are. So what we're looking at here is, uh, if you can see the um, vertical axis, it's showing us the uh, global mean temperature relative to the pre-industrial era, where 0.0, .0 is the average temperature of the pre-industrial era. And so on the horizontal axis here, we're looking at years. So if we start in the year 1880, uh, all this period where we see these blue bars, um, the global mean temperature is uh, of year to year, 1880 to around 1940, is always below the zero threshold. So the global mean temperature is, is cooler than the pre-industrial era. We have this, uh, uh, this uh, spike up in the global mean temperature uh, basically during World War II. Uh, but really, if we follow the trajectory, it's not until the year 1980 that we have this persistent increase in the global mean temperature and we see what's happening. So in 1980, the average global mean temperature is 0 0.2 degrees above pre-industrial levels, the two degree uh, average for the globe. Now we see it rising. It's rising to the point at which uh, as of last year, 2020, we are at 1.0 degrees, one full degree Celsius above the pre-industrial level. And now also look at the rate of increase because it's only um, as of roughly the year 2000 that we were only at uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 degrees. So it's, it's been over the last 20 years that we've gone to roughly a 0 0.5 degree uh, above pre-industrial level in the global mean temperature to where we are today at one degree so if we keep moving at this trajectory by the year 2040, we will have uh, breached this threshold. We will have breached the 1.5 degree uh, threshold and we will see all these tipping points with the global climate uh, getting worse. That's what we're looking at. Uh, now, uh, to just emphasize this point, a study that just came out three months ago from another UN agency, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, put out a study um, in February. Um, and here is the summary from the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, uh, say, stating as follows. 2021 is a make or break year to confront the global climate emergency. I can't emphasize that enough. 2021 is a make or break year. And guess what? We're almost halfway through 2021. Uh, so we, uh, it, we are not seeing the level of intense commitment through the course of this year that Secretary General Guterres is emphasizing is imperative. As he says, the science is clear to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius we must cut global emissions by 45% uh, by 2030. And he goes on and he says, uh, the last sentence, the major emitters must step up with much more ambitious emission reduction targets for 2030 uh, in their nationally determined contributions well before the November UN Climate Conference in Glasgow. So, you know, again, we're only 10 months away from November, and we need to see uh, much more uh, committed <laughs> efforts uh, by the major emitters and throughout the world. Okay.
So that's the, uh, the, the situation we're facing. Now, what to do about it? Um, basically, uh, I'm gonna argue that the solutions are straightforward and simple, certainly analytically, certainly on paper, technically, financially, uh, not politically, of course, uh, but let's just deal with the things that we know we can handle. The first thing we need to do is to transform the global energy system. Why? Because burning fossil fuels, burning oil, coal, and natural gas to produce energy is responsible for about 70% of all global greenhouse emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, nitric oxide, and methane emissions. So burning fossil fuels is the first problem. It's the most fundamental problem. So the solution is simple analytically. The solution is to eliminate fossil fuel consumption altogether uh, over the course of the next 30 years. Now, uh, that sounds like a daunting task. And of course, in some ways it is, but it's also when we think about if we actually start now, if we cut emissions from current uh, cut consumption of fossil fuels from the current level by about three and a half percent this year and keep cutting by the same amount absolute amount every year, we will hit the target. So three and a half percent baseline from this year, uh, we will hit the target. Now, obviously, if we're gonna maintain economic activity and not destroy living standards, we cannot just cut fossil fuels as a source of energy. We have to replace it with something else. So what we replace it with, I would argue, uh, are two basic sources of alternative energy. One is energy efficiency, which is to make buildings, transportation systems, and industrial activity dramatically more efficient. And if you read the relevant literature, uh, in order to get to something like 30 to 40 percent more efficiency in public transportation, in automobiles, in car, in, in buildings, in uh, industrial machinery, in computers, um, is entirely viable and is actually by far the least expensive way uh, to uh, supplant fossil fuels and to reduce emissions. So that's uh, step one. And step two is to replace uh, the energy that we still need to consume. Uh, we use renewable energy, solar, wind, geothermal, small scale hydro, low emissions, bioenergy as the primary new energy source globally. Now I've done some modeling on, okay, how much would it take in investments in order to invest sufficiently in energy efficiency and renewable energy in order to drive the energy system globally. And my result is uh, about uh, two and a half percent of uh, global GDP, all economic activity per year in clean energy investments. Now, it's, uh, is that a big number? Is that a small number? Well, of course, it's a huge number in one sense. Uh, if we took two and a half percent of today's global GDP, that's about two and a half trillion dollars. If we map it out uh, over until 2050, assuming the global economy is, is growing, uh, it's going to be about four and a half trillion dollars per year. Um, so yes, that's a lot of money. On the other hand, it's still only two and a half percent of GDP, meaning 97 and a half percent of G of all economic activity does not have to be devoted to transforming the energy system. So it's something that is entirely achievable. And I should just mention, this comes out of my own model, but uh, just about two or three weeks ago, another UN agency, the International Renewable Energy Agency, ARENA, came out with their own model, totally separate from mine. I don't even know the people there. Um, they came out with their own model as to what it would take to achieve a zero emissions economy through uh, uh, eliminating fossil fuels and building out the clean energy system. And their model actually came in at almost exactly the same number as mine. Theirs was $4.4 trillion per year. So we both could be wrong. Uh, we are certainly not exactly right. You know, these are approximations based on assumptions, 
but we have a sense of which that the level of investment necessary to transform our energy system is a reasonable number. It is not going to take 30% of GDP. It is not going to mean we have to stop doing everything else. But we do have to spend, in, on average, about 2.5% of global GDP per year. Now, right now, we're, it's not, we're not at zero. We're spending between 04 and 0.6%. So we're at roughly uh, uh, one half of 1%. So we need to ramp it up to about uh, another two percentage points relative to global GDP. Now, the second thing that we need to do is to transform our agricultural system. Why? Because uh, our existing corporate dominant industrial agricultural practices are responsible for the other 30% roughly of greenhouse gas emission. So again, uh, burning oil, coal, and natural gas to produce energy is responsible for 70% roughly, and agriculture is responsible for the other 30%. Now, what do I mean when I say the uh, global corporate uh, agricultural system? Uh, first, uh, deforestation is uh, a major source of uh, carbon dioxide, as well as other um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, meaning basically that uh, trees store carbon dioxide. Therefore, when you chop down trees and chop down trees en masse through deforestation, you are releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And you're also eliminating that carbon sink. You're eliminating the capacity of the tree to serve as an absorber of CO2. So deforestation is massively contributing to, um, uh, to uh, climate change. And a, a recent study, I just read about it actually less than a week ago. Um, that is now for the first time, the Amazon rainforest is in this situation in which it is actually releasing more CO2 than it is absorbing, that it released over the past decade, roughly 20% more CO2 than it absorbed, which reflects the ongoing aggressive rate of deforestation that absolutely must stop. Now, the other sources of uh, CO2 and other uh, emissions in the, in the sphere of agriculture are number one with cattle farming, because cattle farming takes up uh, far more land than any, any other agricultural activity, and therefore is the main source uh, for uh, investing in deforestation to clear land for cattle farming. And as we also know, uh, cattle uh, release methane um, through their digestion. So that's about responsible itself for about 4% of total emissions. Uh, the other big issue with respect to agriculture is the uh, industrial agricultural system depends heavily on uh, fertilizer from natural gas, nitrogen fertilizer that again is releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. So we have to move uh, from industrial agriculture into organic farming that does not rely on uh, natural gas as a source of fertilizer. And then we also have to uh, think about doing a lot less waste in the food that we produce. And that would then also re reduce pressure on land, which in turn is uh, producing pressure for deforestation. So those are the two big projects. They're very straightforward. They don't require massive new technological innovations, though those would be helpful, uh, but not imperative. We need to transform our energy system through some basic measures, and we need to transform our agricultural system. Okay, now where are we with respect to policy? There have been, uh, consonant with what the Secretary General of the UN described, there have been uh, major commitments made, certainly in terms of the uh, level of rhetoric uh, and the level of what has been put down in paper. And uh, these are the European Green Deal. These are official uh, initiatives of the European Green Deal of the European Union and our new president, uh, Biden. 
they have come up with uh, climate stabilization programs and they say all the right things. They are, don't maybe say exactly what I just told you, but they are at least in line, which of course is a, a dramatic change from what we had here in the US under our previous president. Uh, but in any case, here's the critical thing. Uh, in order to uh, get on a viable climate stabilization path, we can't just say we are for transforming the energy system. We can't just say we're for transforming the agricultural system. We have to make the investments that will achieve those results. And in both cases, the European project and the US project, the right things are being said, but the level of financial commitment is not adequate. So if you look at the official documents of the European Union with respect to the European Green Deal, they are suggesting that the level of expenditure over the next decade is going to be in the range of 100 billion euros per year, a trillion euros over the course of the decade. Well, if we make some basic simple assumptions about economic growth in Europe uh, over the next decade, uh, we come out with this European Green Deal at around 0.7% of European uh, economic activity. Now, one could argue, okay, Europe is already ahead of say the US in terms of energy efficiency and uh, renewables, which it is. And that therefore maybe we can say, well, they don't have to be at two and a half percent of GDP. They can maybe be a little bit lower, but 0.7% is not going to cut it. That's pretty clear. There isn't a single model of which I'm aware, which suggests that 0.7% spending of the overall economic activity is going, to, is going to cut it. Now, I've read their documents carefully and they uh, make it clear that when they say a, a trillion dollar, a trillion euros over the decade, 100 billion per year, roughly, they do mean everything. They don't just mean uh, EU budget, they don't mean national government budgets. They mean EU national governments private. And so that figure is uh, simply inadequate, not close to adequate for meeting the climate emission targets. The Biden proposal that he came out with last uh, month in March called the American Jobs Plan. I've also looked at that very carefully. Again, uh, at the level of rhetoric, it is uh, welcome, greatly welcome relative to what we've been through in the previous four years. Uh, but uh, if you parse out what we're talking about with respect to actual spending on climate stabilization projects, um, it gets us to about 0.4% of U US GDP. Now, this one, at least unlike the Euro EU project, this is supposed to be spending by the US federal government. So you could say, well, you're at 0.4% of GDP, the state governments and the private sector are gonna get us all the way up closer to two and a half percent. But that is not clear at all. And in fact, having just been in a meeting yesterday with some people in the Congress, uh, it's not even clear that they think that the $100 billion a year from the federal government out of the Biden initiative is, uh, is gonna be forthcoming. So while we do have a breakthrough, you know, uh, relative to what Secretary General Gutierrez was talking about, we definitely have a breakthrough in terms of the level of discussion, but in terms of the commitment, financial commitments, we're nowhere near where we need to be. So this is an issue that has to be uh, a, a tremendously uh, focused, concentrated on in the months and years to, uh, to come. Now, the Global Green New Deal, as, uh, as I've uh, described it most recently in the book uh, that Professor Agliardi uh, so nicely mentioned, uh, Climate Crisis and the, and the Global Green New Deal with Noam Chomsky. Um, the Global Green New Deal is a project to not just hit the emission reduction targets, which it is, but to do it in a way that also is expanding, raising living standards, and particularly targeting well-being for working people and the poor. And the whole, the entire package comes together actually, again, 
in a very straightforward way. Now, why? Um, well, if we're going to invest, let's say this year, $2.2 trillion in uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy, and four and a half trillion dollars per year on average over the next 30 years. When you invest in those things, you create jobs. If you invest in anything, you create jobs. If we invest in, you know, putting up chewing gum uh, machines in Bologna, somebody's got to put up the chewing gum machines. <coughs> that will create jobs. So the relevant question is how many jobs? Who gets the jobs? How good are the jobs? So that is the area uh, on which I've done a lot of work with co-authors. And uh, what we have found consistently, uh, looking at conditions in, in many countries, uh, not Italy, but I have done Spain, I have done Greece, um, among European countries, but consistently we find that the job creation is in the range of about two to three times more employment than you would get if you just sustained your existing fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and of course, for countries that are dependent on, on imports of energy, uh, the job creation is even more because it's a form of import substitution. Instead of importing energy, you can build a green energy infrastructure within your domestic economy. Um, so that's step one. It's creating a lot of jobs. They're not necessarily all good jobs, but they will at least by through the employment expansion create opportunities for organizing around by unions and for setting labor standards and creating opportunities, opening opportunities for women that have been out of the uh, construction industry, for example, where uh, this will be a major source of job creation and construction, uh, open these up to women in the US at least, open them up uh, to people of color that have been uh, deprived of those opportunities. So this is an area around which it, we don't necessarily create good jobs. We create a lot of jobs, and then we have to organize to make sure they're good jobs. Uh, the global Green New Deal also means uh, when you stop burning fossil fuels, uh, you're going to dramatically reduce air pollution. And air pollution is uh, throughout the world, especially in developing countries, uh, the major source of uh, a range of health problems. A third feature of the Global Green New Deal, it will create opportunities for alternative ownership forms. And this little box here of, uh, is supposed to actually be down here under this uh, green box to the, all the way to the right. But what we're talking about here is that, and, and this has been uh, more prevalent in Europe so far, is that we do see small scale uh, energy um, ownership emerging because you can efficiently create small scale community wind farms, solar farms, solar panels on roofs, uh, wind turbines in agriculture uh, without reducing the amount of productivity of the, of the agricultural uh, features of the land. Uh, we see this uh, throughout the, the US, in fact, in the Great Plains states, which are basically mostly ironically, Republican uh, pro-Donald Trump states. Meanwhile, the farmers in the states are putting up wind turbines on their farms and they have a second source of income. That's a model that can be generalized. Uh, it's actually also happening in Alaska to some degree. And finally, we're going to see lower energy costs. Lower energy costs, why? Because if we invest in energy efficiency, uh, that by definition means you get more energy resources by consuming less energy. And secondly, uh, this has been extremely dramatic. The costs of renewable energy have come down uh, to the extent that they are at parity or lower than the costs of fossil fuels. So in particular, the costs of solar energy have come down by over 80% just in the last decade, 80% in the last decade. So just to cite one example, the average cost of solar panels a solar photovoltaic uh, was uh, 37.8 cents in 2010. It's 6.8 cents now. Uh, that is on the low end of what you get from the whole range of fossil fuel energy uh, globally. Uh, the fossil fuel energy to generate electricity ranges now between about 5 cents 
and 18 cents. And so solar is already cheaper. Okay. Uh, the other thing, if we're going to think about a global green new deal and not just purely an energy transformation, uh, we have to think about the transition for fossil fuel workers and communities. This is absolutely critical. Let's say you don't care about the fossil fuel workers and communities. We all should, but let's say you didn't. Uh, it's nevertheless, it would be uh, politically impossible to undertake the kind of transformation that we're talking about unless there is support for the workers and communities who will be hurt. Though there will be a very large scale job creation going on, uh, obviously the workers who are now employed in the fossil fuel industry will see their jobs go away. So uh, what we've talked about in various works I've done is a program that has to be generous where you guarantee the workers pension you guarantee them another job at equal pay um, and as needed re retraining and relocation. I did a, a study of this for the US that came out a few months ago and my estimate and uh, is a very generous program. So it assumes even if you take a job, it can be in clean energy, it can be in anything else. But if you take a job, you used to be working in coal, now you're working in clean energy, the estimate is actually today, you're gonna to make about 30% more in coal than you are in clean energy. But anyway, the program would make up the difference in full. If you were at $100,000, you go down to $70,000 in clean energy, we bring you back to 100,000. Anyway, I did an estimate of that for the whole US economy. And my estimate was that it would cost about $2 billion a year, which actually is minuscule. As you can see, it's less than 0.1% of 0.01% uh, of GDP. We also have to think about uh, investing in the communities uh, that have been dependent on oil, coal, and natural gas. We have to uh, clean up the damaged land and repurpose the land. And I think there's the, the best example that I know of as to how this is being done actively now is in Germany in the Ruhr Valley that used to be the center of the coal uh, industry in Germany. And they are uh, repurposing the land uh, to put up very large scale solar and hydro installations in the former coal mines. It's a great example. I've used it in uh, working on this in, in here in the US. Now, what about the degrowth as an alternative? Uh, I've, I've been in debates, friendly debates with proponents of degrowth now for a few years. I was in one just a few days ago, actually. And I want to say that the degrowth movement, and many of you may be uh, supporters of it or actively in it, I agree with, let's say, 91% of the degrowth movement. I agree that uh, we are consuming, we uh, high affluent people in rich countries uh, can consume less. Speaking for myself, I could consume less. I agree with that. Okay, so there's no debate there. I agree that we shouldn't focus on GDP as a measure of overall well being. Uh, GDP does not take account of the distribution of who gets what money and goods and services. It doesn't take account of a home uh, employment, working at home for no pay. Uh, it doesn't take account of environmental damage. It doesn't take account of racism. Obviously, I agree with all of those things. And those are critical features of the degrowth critique. Uh, that said, the degrowth as a program doesn't get us onto a climate stabilization path. And I'll just mention two ways in which this is true. Uh, first, at the level of, okay, can we reduce emissions? Degrowth does not get us there as much as we might like it to, it just doesn't. Because right now in the entire globe, we generate about 33 billion tons, metric tons of CO2 emissions, okay? 33 billion tons. Now uh, that means if we hit the climate emission targets, that means in eight and a half years, we have to be at let's say 16 billion tons. And in 28 years, we have to be at zero. 
Now, if we just talk about degrowth, meaning reducing economic activity, um, we reduce economic activity by 10%, let's say. Uh, that means GDP is down by 10%. That means a depression, okay? Way worse than we just experienced with COVID. Okay, we have a 10% reduction in GDP, a depression. Now, what does it get us in terms of emission reduction? If you don't change the energy system, you reduce GDP by 10%, emissions go down by 10%. You reduce GDP by 20%, emissions go down by 20%. It does not get us to where we need to go. 50% emissions by eight and a half years, 2030, uh, zero by 2050. There is no way to get there. I've been in several discussions with the proponents and there simply is no way to get there. Uh, so I would re regard that as a major flaw of the degrowth approach. Secondly, I don't even think the terminology really helps us, frankly. Why? Well, what I just talked about, we need our clean energy system to grow, massively grow, grow at an extremely rapid rate. So why are we mincing words and saying we want to talk about degrowth when we actually have to have a massive growth of clean energy systems and an equally massive growth of organic agricultural systems. That is the fundamental premise, in my view, of a climate solution. Now, at the same time, sure, the fossil fuel infrastructure has to degrow to zero, okay, if we want to use the term degrowth. Deforestation has to stop. If you want to say deforestation degrows to zero, Fine, we can use that term. I think it's a rather awkward term. But anyway, uh, these are my problems with degrowth. And I think we are better off focusing more specifically on the things we really need to accomplish, which is how do we get emissions down? What needs to grow massively as well as what needs to be contracting rapidly? Okay, I'm gonna wrap up. The, Green New Deal, as my view, is a project that can work right now, starting yesterday. Um, it is going to work in the way that it is a st climate stabilization path. It can increase job opportunities, especially coming out of our severe COVID recession. It, it can work as a short-term program for uh, creating jobs, and moving us onto a climate stabilization path, raising mass living standards and fighting poverty. Okay, so I'm done. Thank you again very much for having me. And I very much look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you very much, Professor Paulin, for your great presentation, which is really rich in a, uh, various insights and many discussion points. And I'm sure that it will be a very rich discussion as well. Uh, of course, you covered many, many different issues, and I'm going just to start uh, with a uh, specific question, if you want, because after all, uh, I'm just taking your point that, of course, we have to get to net zero emission in no less than 30 years. And just to rephrase uh, uh, an opinion piece of yours, uh, how do we pay for a net zero emission economy? I'm, I'm just focusing on uh, one particular possibility, and I'd like to have your opinion on this, because as you know, there has been a lot of debate uh, recent years about the role of the central banks, uh, um, not only talking about the European Central Bank, but also the Federal Reserve and in general central banks. Of course, in Europe, uh, climate change policy is a sort of cornerstone of uh, uh, European policy, but as you said, spending is inadequate. So the question would be, do you think that there might be a role for central banks? Of course, uh, the discussion and the debate has been particularly harsh recently because, uh, uh, I mean, some economists uh, think that it would be very useful for central banks to say uh, mm, assets uh, uh, toward uh, low carbon assets uh, as a collateral, but at the same time, this should be performed in a way that uh, 
uh, the major mandate of central banks uh, uh, becomes uh, uh, unaffected. In particular, on one side, uh, there is reason for optimism because uh, uh, many central banks have already been investing a lot in climate expertise and also research departments in central banks have been constructive contributors to research. And for example, in general, as far as the financial system, there has been the network for bringing the financial system, which shows the willingness, in my opinion, for central banks uh, to coordinate best practices and uh, in order to be able to approach climate change. But at the same time, uh, there are also others uh, who see some potential dangers, in particular, uh, in the attempt uh, to take uh, a mandate which is broader than the mandate of central banks uh, and uh, with uh, not very well defined mandates uh, that could compromise, they say, central bank and independence. And at the same time, uh, there are also other problems in terms of uncertainties, in terms of the fact that the climate change mitigation targets are addicted to currently well-defined uh, mandates could generate excessive expectations and at the same thing could divert resources from and attention away from fiscal policies. So the question is in general, whether you see that uh, uh, monetary policy can have a role in order, let's say, to foster transition, at least to foster transition in, in the medium term. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Um, so, so are we ha we're having an echo. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So should I stop sharing? Okay, good. Whoops. Um, okay, good, good thing. Great question, thank you very much. Um, actually, there is just a, a new movement here in, among climate activists in the US uh, to insist that the, uh, the, the Biden appoint uh, a head of the Federal Reserve as somebody who's committed around climate change. This has just emerged in the last couple of days, um, which I think underscores the, the potential central role of central banks in addressing climate change. I mean, I, people in general, I think, are not aware of the enormous role that central banks play and can play in every feature of the economic activity. So just in the last year, uh, looking at the role of central banks over the COVID crisis, and the, the, the US Federal Reserve purchased $4 trillion of assets on Wall Street, 4 trillion. That's 20% of US GDP basically was dumped onto Wall Street to keep them afloat. Now we can debate whether that was the best use of resources, but it shows you the, uh, the potential. Uh, the, uh, the European Central Bank didn't do exactly the same thing, but it was comparable in terms of the bailout uh, to maintain financial markets intact as is uh, through the crisis. And that's why, as we saw, I mean, as far as I know, this is the first time this has ever happened in any recession. Uh, whereby, um, you know, unemployment spikes, uh, but the stock market is shooting up. Uh, both, you know, globally, stock market went up over the last year by about 60%. Uh, all due entirely to both, yes, the fiscal stimulus, but even more so, in my opinion, uh, the uh, role of the central bank. So the central banks could finance, let's say, a very high 50% of this whole project, when I say two and a half percent of GDP, global GDP, uh, they could finance it by purchasing bonds. So let's think about, let's say, um, let's not just think about the US and Europe, let's think about uh, African countries, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya, let's think about India, uh, let's think about uh, Colombia, uh, Ecuador, and so forth. Uh, they issue bonds. Uh, you know, uh, we, we can think about how exactly to structure it. Uh, we, they, they issue bonds and let's say the, I don't know, the World Bank buys the bonds and then the central bank buys the bank, the bonds from the, um, 
the World Bank or from the countries. Or, you know, thinking about the US, the state governments issue bonds and then the uh, Federal Reserve would buy them. They can do that. In fact, legally they can do that. Uh, I actually had a discussion on this point about four or five years ago with Janet Yellen, who was at the time the head of the, the Federal Reserve. And I asked her, she, yeah, we could do it. Um, we never have, um, but they've done other things that they never had done before. I mean, over the last year, the, the central, the Federal Reserve uh, purchased junk bonds, uh, which they'd never bought before. So if you can buy junk bonds, you can buy green bonds. And once they do that, you know, effectively that is creating money uh, that is putting uh, resources into the economy. It, it, it would really dramatically reduce the pressure to get funds from other sources. I think we should get funds from other sources. As uh, you know, Chomsky and I talk about in our book, we talk about, and, and ours is a sketch, of course, uh, we talk about other sources. Number one, you know, eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, there are, you know, uh, something like whatever, $2 trillion total in global fossil fuel subsidies. Now, most of those subsidies go to make prices of uh, energy cheaper for low income people. So if you're going to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies, you have to give them to back to people in form of subsidizing, say, solar energy. And that, that is a great project because if we subsidize solar energy, say in Sub-Saharan Africa, that means maybe you can build out small scale solar farms in rural parts of Sub-Saharan Africa that have no electricity now. So the central bank's role in my view is critical. And I know Christina Lagarde, when she became head of the European Central Bank, again, she made beautiful statements about, you know, I can't look my grandchildren in the eye unless I do something about climate change. And she is, she's talking, and they, but you know, what they're mainly talking about now, and I, last time I checked, I don't know, a week or two ago, they're talking about uh, climate risk. And that's different than financing climate investment. They're saying that if, you know, once as an insurance company, if we factor in the risks that we face, then you know, the interest rates on the bonds that are of fossil fuel companies, they should go up, they should be less attractive. And that's, that's something, but that doesn't mean, no, we're gonna put a trillion dollars into green investments. So that's where I think we have to move both uh, in the US and the European Central Bank. And I think both of them should take responsibility, not just for their own uh, regions, but as a global project. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'm probably asking you another uh, thing, and then of course I leave the floor to the students. I'm sure that there will be many interesting questions. Uh, and this again is a, a very, let's say, a question which is related in some way uh, to another aspect of your talk. You actually showed the different sectors where investment should. Uh, uh, I mean, it should be met. And uh, uh, the question that I was thinking is that uh, perhaps uh, we should need, or at least my question is whether you think that we should uh, have more, let's say, uh, climate information architecture, to use an expression that was also used within the, the International Monetary Fund recently. I mean the following, that not all companies disclose climate metrics at the same level. In many cases, we, uh, have, we do not have a harmonized and consistent set of climate disclosure standards. More generally, in terms of taxonomies, I think, for example, of green bonds and green projects, uh, there is still not a broadly agreed uh, uh, convention among the uh, global taxonomy in terms of classification of activities of projects, assets that, uh, let's say, clarify the extent to which uh, uh, projects are uh, climate friendly. So the question is that uh, I believe that uh, to make even more progress, a uniform implementation of, let's say, internationally agreed sustainability standards should uh, be introduced, even though, of course, this is 
uh, in a sense, difficult to implement. These days we have plenty of taxonomies, probably we have too many taxonomies, and at the same time, uh, in some cases, it is not so straightforward to understand uh, the, uh, let's say, the carbon intensity of the different projects. So the question would be whether you think that uh, there is a still need uh, at international level, um, I mean, uh, um, uh, the I mean, at international level, uh, a way to implement, uh, let's say, uh, more uh, agreed uh, uh, standards. I think that's a great, great. So, Pauline, sorry. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Sure. I would just like to ask if you could respond really briefly to this very articulated and super interesting question, just because um, we received so many questions from the public. So, we would just like to have. Um, super brief uh, response so we can conclude the reflection of Professor Ayardi, which was very interesting and on the point. So, so. Sure. I mean, okay, I, I don't have other, other than, I mean, uh, Professor Agliardi laid out the ideas extremely well and I would just say, I agree. I, I think it's an important thing. Um, so for example, yeah, every major investment activity should uh, also include information on the climate impact. And we can start from there. And that would then of course make it easier to regulate. So if let's say we have utilities and we say, you know, every year you have to, uh, you have to report on your carbon intensity and we also need to see it going down by 4% per year. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop at that. Thank you, Professor Pauline, for the answer. Uh, even if this was really, really on point. And also thank you so much to Professor Yardi for the very interesting moderation question, just to sum up the conference. Uh, now I would like to leave the floor to the question from the public, which were very, very numerous. We had almost like, we, we had 20 questions, but we will start focusing on the most voted one. And the first one is from an, an anonymous um, uh, viewer. And he or she asked, seeing that there's a lack of effective institutions able to enforce the terms of certain agreements, how can these issues be resolved? Well, mm. I think we have to uh, recognize that there has been progress, uh, significant progress, and uh, it's almost entirely due to young people organizing uh, that these issues have come to the forefront. I mean, again, if we just take the example of Christina Lagarde, the head of the European Central Bank saying, my own children and grandchildren are telling me I've got to do something. And uh, so I mean, the institutions exist. I mean, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that I mentioned, the inter inter um, uh, arena, industrial renew in International Renewable Energy Agency, another great agency that e exists. Uh, you know, uh, the European uh, Union, they've put out great uh, kind of statements. So everybody knows what they think they need to say, at least we're at that point. Uh, so what we really need is the institutions that exist uh, to commit much more deeply. And to do that is an issue, where it's around politics, political organizing. And I'll say, especially in, here in the US, we have seen a sea change in a really critical set of institutions, uh, which are the labor unions, who had been not so favorable to this project until recently, but they have uh, since, I think, increasingly become committed, in part because they recognize the employment opportunities that would be forthcoming. Okay. Thank you very, very much for the response. Um, then we have the second question from Gaia, and I guess we're going to read also the third one from Elisa. And the first one from Gaia is um, given the, the same academic field of a lot of people during this conference. What are some gaps in the academic arena that our generations who focus on filling in climate related research? Okay. Uh... You know, the kinds of things that I laid out, 
that I obviously I wouldn't have laid them out if I didn't think they're true. Uh, I, I think we know those things, but what, there's so many things that need to be filled out um, at, at various levels. Um, so uh, for example, the question that uh, we just talked about with respect to financing. So, uh, you know, this needs to be concretized. Uh, if we have a trillion dollars or, the, or thereabouts in uh, fossil fuel subsidies, how do, we can't just say cut them entirely because they really are uh, to a large extent, a form of poverty reduction by giving people low cost energy. So how do we, how do we transition to create a uh, green energy subsidy system that really meets people's needs, especially in poor places. And so that's just one example. Another example that has come up, I mentioned I've been do doing some work in Greece. Um, I don't know if any of you are from Greece or you know the situation there. There's a lot of justified hostility around uh, the siting of, um, of the wind turbines because they're siting them on these, uh, these pristine places at the mountaintops. So the, the argument is, well, uh, this is where you can get the most wind. And if you wanna go green, this is what you have to do. Well, I don't know that that's necessarily true. In fact, I would argue that it's not true, but we need to do a lot more work in understanding these issues with respect to land use and siting and do it in a way that meets, that's consistent with social need. Perfect. Thank you so much. Then we have just the last question. And I would just ask like a, a brief comment since uh, it relates to, to your own state. And it's from Elisa. And she's asking, in your opinion, Biden presidency is going to be an effective step forward for the US Green Revolution. Could it pave the way to other states too? I think it is a, 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 a huge step forward. Well, if you all remember our previous president, it wouldn't take very much to be a step forward. Uh, so I think that uh, Biden, who by the way, was not my first choice by any means for president, and he's, he's accomplishing a lot more than I would have expected. Uh, he, he has definitely made commitments at the level of uh, appointments, at the level of what he's talking about, at the level of uh, this program that he's introduced. It's not enough. It's, it is effective to your question, Elisa. It is a, an effective step forward. It is not enough and it needs to be pushed further. So other states need to push it further. And we need to see basically a virtuous cycle of countries competing to hit the emission targets. And it's also fine if they compete over who's gonna produce the best solar panels or who's gonna produce the most efficient electric cars or who's gonna transform their public uh, transportation system the most. This is what we re really need to see. Thank you very much, Professor, for answering our question. So oh, we man. have finally come. Sorry. Uh, yes, may please. Also, yes. May I also ask uh, Professor Paulin whether he uh, has a final word to our students, in particular in terms of uh, recommendations and in terms also of indications for their future uh, prospects. So if they, I mean, what is the role of the young generation in, in all this? And I mean, what do you think uh, is, could be your recommendation to them? Well, thank you very much. I mean, I, I think that creating, saving the planet is, is a pretty important project. And it also is a project that as I've described and other people have described, it is a massive opportunity. Um, it sh that's another reason why I'm a little, uh, I'm not comfortable with the degrowth rhetoric. It's a massive growth opportunity. Employment in, in the green economy in all aspects. Okay, if you wanna be an environmental engineer, if you wanna be a truck driver, uh, if you wanna be an accountant, uh, there's all kinds of opportunities that will be emerging and so, uh, and on top of that, it really is young people that are moving the political agenda. It may not seem that way, but it really is. I mean, you know, if it weren't for Greta Thunberg, who knows, we would probably be five years behind. This is just, you know, this young woman who was what, 15 when she started. Uh, 
And it really has, you know, it caught on in the United States. You know, I myself and uh, other old people have talked about Green New Deal or variations for over a decade. It was really this thing called the Sunrise Movement. They sat in on the office of Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, 2018. All of a sudden, the uh, interest in this thing called the Green New Deal exploded. So why? It was the young people that forced it. it. You know, people like me saying these things, oh, okay, there's a few people interested here and there. But it really is the, you know, the young people. And, you know, when you hear Greta say, you know, you're destroying my future. Wow, that's really powerful. And we want to have a future. So I think it, you know, there's, it's, a, it's an area of vast opportunity and it's an area where we need your political energy. Thanks a lot, of course. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Yarti, for your very interesting question. And um, thank you also to Professor Pauling for the answer. So we finally come to the end of this conference. Thank you so much for the, to the moderator and to the speaker. I would just have to say that I, I was really inspired by it. I took so many notes. I was really inspired by the last hope messages about the grassroots action, about the young people action, because all of our, our viewers are, are young students and young people. So we're up to the task. Um, also, I really like the, the, what the Professor Pauling said about uh, the degrowth, because sometimes in the political communication, the sustainable economy is viewed as a slow economy, something that needs to um, stop the progress, but it is really not that. It needs to be fueling the progr to progress. So I'm really glad that I learned uh, this today. So just as final remarks, I would um, kindly ask the viewers, if you enjoyed the conference, to follow us on social media and on our channels for updates, especially on Instagram, and to follow our next conference of Murakami Goods, which is on ethics and surveillance ethics, which is starting at in just a few minutes, like in five minutes. And tomorrow, instead, we will have a career day at 11 a.m. So thank you very, very much to our moderator, Elettra Yardi, Professor Elettra Yardi, because she, she has so many interesting questions and she was able to sum up the, the conference in a very direct way. So thank you, Professor Yardi. And thank you a lot to our speaker, Professor Paulin, to, to, having, to have dedicated so, many, so much of his time to, to this conference. So we are very glad. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Also on behalf of the ICMA Submit. Thank you. So uh, just as for the closing, we're going to post soon the, um, the link for the meet the speaker. So you will be directly um, sent to the breakout room to, to meet the most yeah. interest spectators. Also, also because we received so many questions from the public. Yeah, okay. so I just stay so on. Just stay on and you'll- Yes, the, please. Yeah, okay, fine. Exactly, yes. Thank you so much, Professor Yarti, for your time. I hope that this conference well, was also it was a, a great yeah, really nice. for me. Thanks a lot, and hope to see you very soon. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah, really nice. yeah, we hope to too. Thank you.